Good afternoon, everyone, or to our speaker, good morning to the uh, US. On behalf of the VAM, uh, Christine Lang and I, both vice presidents of the VAM, um, welcome you to the third um, VAM Industry Academia panel with a really, really interesting topic. Um, it's microbial metabolomics, um, which is of utmost interest, I guess, for all of us, if it's about the function of genes, enzymes, and metabolic pathways. Um, we have um, found really two outstanding and excellent speakers I will introduce uh, in a minute. Before of that, some technical announcement. You may have heard that um, the session today um, will be recorded. This is, I guess, important uh, to know. And for discussion, please use either the chat function or you can also uh, raise your hand and ask your question directly. Before we go to the introduction of the speakers, I would like to remind you what we already did last time, that there is a call for the VAM Innovation Award 2023, um, which is uh, dedicated to outstanding innovative scientific work in the field of microbiology, as you can read here in industrial research or development. You see all the requirements here or can find them on our homepage. Um, it's important to notice that uh, at the end, the submission deadline is end of that year and the award ceremony will be in September 2023. And uh, for the next um, Industry Academia panel, the fourth, uh, please make a note, please make save the date or for Thursday, November 17th, again, 5 p.m. Um, and the topic is also a very, very interesting topic. We have already very interesting speakers as well. It's the topic cell factories. So for the sake of time, I would love to introduce the first speaker of today, which is Dr. Jason Winnicky from Metabolon in Morrisville in the US. Um, let me introduce uh, Jason very shortly. Jason joined Metabolon in 2020 and is a senior study director at the Department of Discovery and Translational Sciences. And if you see and read his, his uh, CV, you can see that his whole, let's say, academic life is dedicated to metabolomics. And he worked at prestigious universities and institute like the David H. Murdoch Research Institute and also institutes and university in North Carolina and Louisville. Um, and we will hear more uh, of his work he's currently performing um, in a minute. I have to thank Nina Gurner. Um, she invited Jason uh, for Metabolum. And we are very, very happy that you made it. And the, the talk is entitled Using Metabolomics to measure changes in the microbiome that affect health. A very, very interesting topic. And Jason, thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Well, thank you for the introduction. All right, you should be seeing my screen. Yes, I'm Jason Winnicky. I'm a study director at Metabolome. And the title is, of the talk is Using Metabolomics to Measure Changes in the Microbiome that Affect Health. So we all know that human health is intricately meshed to the relationship between the host and the microbiome. And this, this regulation of this relationship, this equilibrium can negatively impact health and even transition into disease. Um, you know, what is metabolomics? Well, we're taught in school about DNA being transcribed to RNA, which is translated to proteins, which in turn act on metabolites. So metabolomics reflects this biochemical activity within the cells and therefore represents the system's functional status. However, metabolomics can also integrate other inputs such as diet and xenobiotics, the microbiome and lifestyle and other risk factors that um, some of the other omics may miss. So this can provide the definitive representation of the phenotype and is considered to be a key to systems biology. Um, you know, and you know, why Metabolon? Well, we've been doing this for 20 years. We've, um, you know, we've, we've worked through a lot of sample types and projects. Uh, our global metabolomics library is 5,400 metabolites. It's the world's largest reference library. These metabolites cover a very large range of 
different metabolic pathways. And in those 20 years, we've worked on various disease states, uh, various sample types, a huge number of different projects with different types of collaborators. Um, so we've we've really worked through a lot um, and we've, I don't necessarily want to say we've seen it all, but we've seen a lot um, and we've worked through a lot. Um, so, so how do we do it? Well, at Metabolon, we have three main arms. We have our global metabolomics assay. Um, we have our complex lipid panel, which is a quantitative panel of 1,100 different lipids, uh, triacylglycerols, diacylglycerols, monoacylglycerols, phospholipids, sphingolipids, lysophospholipids. Um, and we also have targeted uh, quantitative assays where you know, these are already created assays. You can measure quantitatively amino acids, bile acids, but we also have the ability to um, create custom targeted assays. So, you know, you could very well use the global assay on your experiment or your um, disease state of interest uh, and, then, and then see a pathway of interest that is perturbed and then follow up by using a targeted assay, for instance. So the, the global discovery panel, this is kind of our, our, our bread and butter of the company. Um, you know, we don't, we don't just start, you know, you don't toss your samples over a fence and we toss back over a spreadsheet with numbers. Uh, we, we really do consult from beginning to the end of the project. So on the front end of the project, you know, we work on study planning or the, you know, can metabolism Metabolomics be applied to your project. Uh, what are appropriate controls, uh, replicate numbers, sample types, all that. So we'll work through that. Um, and over the 20 years in business, we've, you know, we're really worked out sample processing for various sample types uh, um, using uh, robotic sample handling. Um, and then the data acquisition, that's one of the very important parts. We we found that to get comprehensive coverage, we split the sample and run it in four different uh, LCMS platforms, just because we found that you know we don't get the coverage we need with just one or two or even three. So we want to look at polar metabolites, non-polar metabolites, large metabolites, small metabolites, everything in between. And so that's why we've we 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 do this these four arms to get this comprehensive coverage. And from that we get a tremendous amount of data, 150,000 ion features, for instance, um, an incredible amount of data. So we have our automated data processing routines, machine learning techniques to really kind of distill this data down into you know, uh, values and metabolites. Uh, and then from there, the, the data gets passed on to our in-house statistical team, just to ensure that appropriate statistics are employed for your project. And then this fully you know, worked out and distilled data set would come to someone like me, a study director, and that's where we would do biological interpretation. Um, you know, we, we kind of see what's going on as a whole, look at the big picture um, and provide these changes uh, and these differences to you. So how does a microbiome fit in there? Well, over the past decade, significant advances have been made in the understanding of the relationship between microbes and their contribution to human health and disease. Uh, we're now starting to better understand this human microbe relationship and understanding how these symbiotic, and, you know, these interconnected pathways can influence disease. Um, but since the microbiome is known to have distal effects on you know, other organs, um, such as how a gut microbiome can affect the brain, these actions are mediated by small molecules, metabolites that enter circulation. So this makes metabolomics a key tool in understanding this relationship. So I'd like to talk about this great study, this Nature publication, which highlights how the microbiome can affect amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, and how metabolomics and metabolon in particular help to play a role in understanding how the microbiome can influence this disease. So ALS, um, also known as motor neuron disease or Lou Gehrig's disease in the United States, is a neurodegenerative disease with 
few treatment options and no cures. ALS results in the gradual loss of motor neurons that control voluntary muscles. And most cases of ALS have no known cause and average survival is unfortunately three to five years from diagnosis. So in this study, the relationship between ALS and the microbiome was explored. And as mentioned, the, the effects of the microbiome on the host at points distal to the gut are mediated by metabolites. So that really makes metabolomics an integral piece in understanding this relationship. So in this study, SOD1 G93A transgenic mouse model of ALS was used. And this mouse model shows disease onset around 80 days and signs of advanced disease at 140 days. Uh, transgenic and wild type mice were analyzed with and without antibiotics um, starting at 40 days, seen here. So, you know, to deplete the microbiome. And periodically, the animals were tested for motor ability and neurological score. So these tests here, which I'll highlight throughout the study, are the rotorod locomotor test, which is the time it takes for a mouse to fall from a rotating rod. The hanging wire grip test, where the mouse's grip score is assessed based on how well the animal is able to hang onto and even pull itself up a metal wire. So for both of these, higher is better. Uh, and the neurological score, which is an assessment of the animal's body control and rigidity. And in this case, lower is better. So as shown here on the right side, transgenic mice, um, here in blue, were they had worsening motor skills and neurological skills compared to wild type, which is here in black. Um, and the wild type mice, black here and here, and wild type with antibiotics, there's, there's no difference in their motor skills or neurological score uh, due to antibiotic administration. However, these transgenic mice in blue, when they were given antibiotics, there was a, a marked decline in motor skills in red um, and neurological score. So, suggesting that dysbiosis of the gut microbiome may exacerbate disease progression in ALS. So modulation of the microbiome with antibiotics can affect severity of ALS. Um, are there differences in the microbiome between mice with ALS compared to wild type, um, which could possibly have an effect on disease? So on this slide, we can see from 16S data, on non-antibiotic mice, that there are very different microbiomes between the wild type and the transgenic mice. These compositional changes started early and persisted throughout the study. Um, there were also differences in the representation of genes encoding nicotinamide and tryptophan pathway enzymes, here and here, respectively, between the wild type and the transgenic mice. And as can be seen here, tryptophan and, metabol and nicotinamide metabolism are linked, as shown in this abbreviated pathway diagram. Um, tryptophan, of course, is an amino acid used for protein biosynthesis. It's also a precursor for other molecules, some of which are bioactive, such as uh, the neurotransmitter serotonin, the hormone melatonin, and kynurenine, which also has immune and inflammatory modulating functions. Um, and additionally, there are also other microbial products of tryptophan metabolism, uh, such as some bioactive indole compounds, which can have both local and distal effects. So as mentioned, the tryptophan metabolism is connected to nicotinamide metabolism. Uh, nicotinamide is commonly known as one of the forms of vitamin B3, as well as one of the building blocks of NAD, which does play a central role in energy metabolism, redox homeostasis, and additionally as a co cofactor and other various other reactions. So if there are differences present in the bacterial composition, as well as the, their representation of genes, are there some microbes that negatively affect ALS or others that positively affect ALS? Um, so to, to, to do this, uh, in investigating the differences between wild type and transgenic mice, both with and without antibiotics, before and after antibiotics at, at two different animal facilities, it was revealed that there were 11 microbial species of interest, which were correlated to degree of ALS severity. 
So these bacterial strains were then mono inoculated into antibiotic treated uh, mice, both wild type and transgenic. Four of these appear were shown to exacerbate ALS symptoms. However, one strain, Acromancia municifilia, which can be seen here on the left, was observed to be lower in the transgenic mice compared to wild type when that one was inoculated into the mice. As you can see here in this Kaplan-Meier plot, it increased lifespan compared to uninoculated control or um, animals, ALS model animals inoculated with other strains. Um, and they also had improved motor functions. So again, here's these motor and neurological scores plots. So you can see the ALS mouse model here in blue. The motor skills were quite poor. However, when inoculated with uh, the acromancia, the motor skills improved and the neurological score also improved. Again, on the right side, neurological score lower is better. Um, and you can see here the wild type, uh, of course, it being an ALS model, it did not, you know, it still had ALS. So these findings that, that certain strains can positively or negatively affect mice with ALS is quite promising. So the next step was to use metabolomics to investigate how the microbes are affecting ALS. So given the, the distal nature of the gut microbiome to the, the CNS, the central nervous system pathophysiology, um, you know, they look for soluble mediators focusing on metabolites stemming from microbial metabolic activity. So thus, metabolomic analysis of the serum was performed which revealed 51 metabolites that were increased with acromancia supplementation compared to PBS control. And of these, two metabolites had the highest metagenomic probabilities to be synthesized by the wild type microbiome, um, phenol sulfate and nicotinamide. And as can be seen here on the left, the acromancia supplemented animals had elevated levels of multiple metabolites involved in the nicotinamide pathway, um, both wild type and ALS mice. Um, so both phenol sulfate and nicotinamide were administered to the animals for four weeks using osmotic mini pumps. Um, and while administration of phenol sulfate did not appear to provide any benefit to the mice, the nicotinamide did, as can be seen here, um, compared to the control. So here's the ALS mouse model here, and here's the model supplemented with nicotinamide. So there's an improvement in its motor skills and an improvement in neurological score. Also, the, the animal lifespan uh, trended a bit higher with nicotinamide administration, although it was not statistically significant. So finally, in preliminary human studies, both compositional and functional differences were observed in the fecal metabolome between human patients with ALS and healthy control family members, as can be seen here in the PCA plots on the left. Um, and if you're not familiar with PCA, it's a dimension reduction procedure where samples are represented as points in n-dimensional space. So your dimensions would be the, the, the species and the, 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 the representation of genes. So the, there's certainly a significant difference in the bacterial species in ALS compared to their healthy control uh, family members, as well as the representation of genes in ALS compared to their healthy control family members. Um, data suggesting a decrease in tryptophan and nicotinamide pathway gene counts um, and a decrease in several genes mapped to acromancia, the acromancia genome were also seen in the ALS subjects. Um, and, and as expected from the mouse studies, the, the serum and the CSF of the subjects with ALS had uh, lower uh, nicotinamide pathway metabolites, and specifically as shown here, nicotinamide itself. Um, so this was just one example of how metabolomics was used to, to analyze the host microbiome relationship, but there are a diverse array of applications for metabolomics in the microbiome. Um, and I'll just very, very briefly touch on three other projects that we've worked on here at Metabolon um, to just kind of show some of this, this wide range of uh, microbiome applications for metabolomics. So in this next study, this, this ACNE study, 
uh, a metabolomic analysis of sebum or the, the oil on your skin was performed. And it was determined that a majority of the sebum lipids were generated from the de novo lipogenesis, unlike other sources of lipids, such as mylum or the, the oil glands in your eye or even plasma triglycerides. So then, then again, on further testing using metabolomics, we showed that systemic inhibition of de novo lipogenesis by targeting acetyl-CoA carboxylase, this decreased lipid production in sebum, which would make this a possible target for the treatment of acne. In this next study, metabolomics was used to examine the role of gut bacteria in anti-tumor surveillance in the liver. So the liver is exposed to bacterial metabolites and products via the portal vein, which connects the intestine and the liver. Um, and using a liver cancer mouse model, administration of antibiotics increased primary bile acids in circulation and decreased secondary bile acids. Um, this is not surprising because secondary bile acids are bile acids that are metabolized by the gut microbiome and then taken back up into the liver via enterohepatic circulation. Um, it is known that primary bile acids activate natural killer T cells. And it was shown here that the increased primary bile acids in the animals exposed to antibiotics increase natural killer T cells, which in turn inhibited tumor growth. And finally, in this other study, uh, metabolomics was used to show that the levels of human milk oligosaccharides present in mother's breast milk correlated very well with the levels detected in the plasma and urine of the baby that fed on this breast milk. Uh, the protective properties of human milk have historically been attributed to antibodies and other bioactive molecules such as nucleotides and cytokines. However, recent evidence suggests that milk oligosaccharides may also play a significant role. Uh, one way that human breast milk is thought to be beneficial, in addition to the development of the gut microbiome, is through systemic beneficial immunomodulation. And this would require the, the human milk oligosaccharides to access the bloodstream of the developing infant and you know, systemically uh, move around. Uh, the levels of these HMOs measured in the baby have been shown to have biological effects in vitro and are thus a promising target for the development of more beneficial, uh, more natural baby formula. So those are just some studies highlighting how metabolomics was used to investigate the host microbiome relationship. Uh, there, there are certainly other, many other practical applications for the use of metabolomics in microbiome analysis um, or even just microbial analysis uh, by itself. So thank you for listening to my talk. Um, Here's my contact information. If you wanted to contact me, uh, you can also contact uh, Nina Gorner, your local Metabolon representative, if you wanted to talk about working with Metabolon or uh, you know, can you use metabolomics for your project, that kind of thing. I'm sure Dr. Gorner would love to hear from you. Thanks. Which brings me, if you see my screen, to the second speaker of today which is for sure well known in the, let's say, VAAM community. It's, it's Uwe Sauer from the ETH Zurich in Switzerland. Uh, Uwe Sauer studied uh, biology in Göttingen and earned his PhD with uh, Professor Peter Dürre in 93. And from then onwards, he was very active um, at the ATH Zurich, Zurich in different kind of uh, positions. As you see here, his research focuses is always around system biology using, let's say, metabolomics and um, really elucidating metabolic networks and the interaction between metabolites and proteins. Um, since 2012, he is full professor for systems biology. And since 2015, he is also president of the ETH Research, research Commission. Uh, we are very happy. I know that you are very busy that you uh, agree to contribute to our panel here. And uh, we are really looking forward, Uwe, to your talk, which is entitled Metabolomics as a Hypothesis Generator. Uwe, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Just a second. Good. So I'm not more busy than other people. And um, 
I'm still considering myself as a microbiologist, really, not only at heart. So I, I decided to make this talk a, a little bit more fun, um, conceptual around how one can use metabolomics to actually generate hypotheses, because that's what this technique, in fact, that's what all omics techniques are really about. And I will, um, it will come in two parts. I will first start with something that is more about the intracellular metabolome, when we do normal metabolomics of cells. And then in the second part, I look more into what Jason also described, exometabolome, things that are leaving cells, and in particular, microbial interactions. So right at the outset, I want to be a little bit more provocative here. I think whatever method you use, there's plenty of metabolomics methods. There's only one factor that will determine whether or not you will be satisfied and successful in the end, and that is your experimental design. And there's a very simple question, which I can tell you uh, fails at least half of the people that want to collaborate with me. If you cannot formulate even the best dream result you in, in, in the metabolomics um, output, how that could help you answer your question, I don't even stop. This is not a technique where you can just do measurements and the data will talk to you. You really have to have some idea of what you're looking for, and then you can check together with people that know this a little bit better, maybe what is a good design of an experiment that, that is doable. But that's really, really important. That's, I, I think this is my number one message today. And why is that so complicated? And I would like to start with the intracellular metabolome. And that is a point that if you measure intracellular metabolites, they reflect basically everything that's happening to the cell. There's a direct influence of pH and temperature of the cell, but then there's uh, many enzymes typically that work on one metabolite, often very many. And, the and because of that, we have no direct connection to the genome anymore. And with proteomics, it's different. You always know which gene encoded the protein. With met metabolites, that's not the case. And then, of course, the enzymes themselves, they're subject to genetic regulation, post-translational modifications. And as soon as the metabolites level change, this feeds back into transcription factor, into other regulation systems, and the enzymes start to change. And the, the concentration of substrates and products themselves will affect the activity of the enzymes. So this is an extremely sensitive system. Whatever you do, the metabolites will change. And so it's a major challenge to actually derive a specific hypothesis, say what this transcription factor is doing something on regulation and coordination. How do you derive a specific hypothesis, even in best possible case that you get perfect data on every metabolite in the cell? And so um, there's different tricks that people use to improve the hypothesis generation. I'm talking here really about intracellular hypotheses. Okay, we're not yet, we're trying to work within one cell. And um, how can we delineate these the direct consequences of um, a, a manipulation, maybe adding a drug or deleting a gene, from indirect consequences? And this will happen all the time. When you delete something, there's feedback mechanisms, the cell grows slower and, or faster, and all of that will change all the metabolite levels. And so um, I'll take here the example of enzyme phosphorylation, um, so post-translation modification. Um, in principle, one can look at Temporal separation, if you, and we have used this a lot for looking at very short changes. If you, um, if you make a very rapid environmental change, one can look at how the cell responds before transcriptional regulation kicks in. But that means you have to work on a time scale that is less than a minute to really see dynamically what are the first changes and how do they propagate. Um, but I would like to use today a different example, and that is to make the perturbations small enough that they remain interpretable. And as I said, it's about enzyme phosphorylation. And if we delete a kinase or a transcription factor, there would be way too many changes. We have done that before, and it's, of course, we've been able to publish it, but it wasn't really very successful because there are too many changes, and it's very hard to learn what was actually what, 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 what was the kinase, for example? What the example we'll use is we do point mutations and in these enzymes. And this is work done by my PhD student, Evgenia. Um, and her question was, what is the functionality of um, phosphorylation in E. coli metabolism? 
And um, just as an outset, there's thousands of reported phosphor sites from phosphoproteomics, but for maybe two handful, we, do we actually know what they're doing function? So almost nothing we know for sure in E. coli, our best characterized organisms. And so she took, this is a representation of central metabolism. And whenever you see a dot, she made a point mutation in Um, someone has to give me a sign if you cannot hear me, otherwise I will just continue to speak. Um, so we mute, she picked um, 52 reported phosphocytes and 23 central metabolic enzymes. And a point mutation means normally there is a reversible phosphorylation, a particular, usually a serine or threonine, and the phosphate can be attached. And an abolishing mutation is when we exchange a serine for an alanine. It's the same it's really the same um, protein. Everything is the same except for this one hydroxyl group. So no phosphate can be attached anymore. And we can do a mimicking that goes in the other direction where we replace the serine, for example, with a glutamate. Um, so there is a, neg as a, as a negative charge in this position to mimic a little bit the, uh, the, the phosphor that would be there. So these are the type of mutations we do. And then um, when we do the experiments, um, now, what you see here on the bottom, uh, on the left side, this is each of these rows is uh, one point mutation and one enzyme. And they're ordered according to the strengths of the effect in this red line on this red column here. That's the gross defects. So we scored whether or not they, um, one of these mutations leads to a phenotype. And already 30 out of the 54 that we tested, two were even lethal, these were known. And some of the others have actually a quite strong phenotype. Gross is reduced. And that's just a single point mutation of an alanine to a serine. Um, and down here, this is the ones why I'm talking about this. These were, they had no phenotype. We couldn't detect it, but they have a metabolite concentration change. And we're not looking for the entire metabolome, but here we focus primarily on what I call the local metabolome. So basically the substrate and the product of a mutated enzyme. And so this is what you see in this column here. So almost all of them have a very local change around where the phosphocyte mutation is, but there's in addition, a lot of other changes too. But because we know what we were mutating here, this helps us to say, okay, this phosphocyte has very likely a function. And so I don't wanna extend this much further, but basically just to say that um, of the more than more than 3,000 phosphor relation sites that were reported. So basically every fourth protein in E. coli is phosphorylated, but only for maybe three, four handfuls do we know what the function is, even in E. coli. So here we show functionality of um, almost all the phosphocytes that we tested. It was not a complete random selection. We picked phosphocytes that were reported to be abundant. So there's a bias, but it still suggests that in E. coli, there's a very extensive Phosphor regulation network, which is something that my lab follows up. Um, in the paper, if you're interested, um, we demonstrate then how some of these phosphocytes regulate, for example, glycolytic flux, so the split between pentose phosphate pathway and Nadudorov pathways. But what I wanted you to remember from this is metabolomics revealed functionality in cases when there was no phenotype. It really helped us for about a third of the enzymes to say, look, it, this is functional, but it is not yet leading to a phenotype. And this was meant to be an example of the problem to work inside the cell. So we have basically so far looked at the intracellular metabolome. Now I would like to go more into microbial community. And that means they, we look now into, they take up something, they secrete something, and some of the other species that might be in a community, they will take up something that other species have secreted. And um, if we just had a snapshot like this, it wouldn't tell us anything because the arrows that are put in there, they have something to do with the movement of molecules and the snapshot doesn't tell us anything about it. And so this is work done mostly by Sammy Pontrelli, but uh, helped by Wilhelmina and Daniela. And here we were interested in the metabolic interactions in a marine community when they're breaking down polymers. 
And the key to success is really to have dynamic data on what is happening to the metabolome. And so now this is a bit complica more complicated because one of the, some of the species secrete degrading enzymes. They degrade these polymers. And then different monomer monomers and different oligomers are produced. And not all of them are taken up by all the cells in the same time. So this is the ecosystem we're essentially looking at here. So there are other approaches to do that. Um, at the end, one would want to learn how a whole community behaves and, and what, who is doing what in a community. But unfortunately, our techniques are not, not only ours, but in general in the field, they are not specific enough to allow us very direct measurements. So we infer this typically from either metagenomic data, metatranscriptomics, or from a perturbation analysis like transposon mutagenesis. To do just the metabolome of a whole community would not tell us very much on who is doing what. And therefore, people often, and we do that too, we use pairwise cultivations that allow some direct hypothesis generation. And then we can use metabolomics. And that's basically what I'm trying to illustrate to you in one particular case. But um, despite all the shortcomings, there's a few lessons we've learned um, as a community. And one is that bacteria secrete, or we're not sure if it's secretion or leakage, but all bacteria secrete many different metabolites. When you look carefully enough, there's a lot of stuff that leaves the cells. Now, this is very different from my naive view that I had many years ago. Um, but the open question is, what of these things that are leaving the cells actually matters to a community? And in complex communities, such as the, the, the gut microbiome, the individual species do not actually really matter so much, but their metabolism does. And this is because there's many more species than there are metabolic behaviors. And there are some good papers that, that make a strong case for this. But um, so really the metabolism of different species can have the same metabolism. That's basically what I'm saying. And so the, in some sense, the metabolic gene content in any given ecosystem is is we know this now is much more stable than the composition of the species, um, and in some cases, in some cases, one can even from essentially counting the abundance of genes learn something about what is exchanged and and a bit information on on flow. So my lab focus is really on identifying the major carbon and energy flows. We're not interested in too many of the details, but the major flows we would want to get. And the trick we use is illustrated here. So um, basically, we grow one species. Um, we follow its optical density. Um, then we separate the cells from this medium. And we take this yellow medium that we call now spent medium, mix it a little bit with new medium, and we inoculate it with the second species. And we follow the growth of the second species now. And we take samples along the way to then do um, metabolomics with this. And so basically what we are looking at is now a certain pattern. This is the hypothesis that we have. We want to identify molecules that are cross-fed from one species to another. And we say it should have a certain pattern. It should be accumulating during the growth of species one. And it should be going down in the species two when it grows on this. And this is a pattern we can now use statistical tools to help us find. So basically, it's a pattern search. And we've used this in kefir communities. We do a lot in the gut microbiome, um, both in, in, in vivo and in, in, in vitro. But the story I want to share with you is on seawater community. Um, and basically, it's about the polymer chitin, which is um, the monomer is gluknak. Um, and see, chitin is, I didn't know that before I started, as the second most abundant biological polymer on Earth. And you can guess what the most, most abundant one is. Um, so it comes from the shell of the crustacean and from the, from the insects. And we have a community that we took from, these are isolates from the seawater. And there are some degraders that can grow on chitin. They secrete these chitinases. The chitinases make these monomers and oligomers. Degraders use them, but there's also other species called exploiters. They cannot degrade chitin, but they can use the monomers. And then there is a quite large number of what we call scavengers that cannot even grow on the monomers, but they can grow on material that the exploiters and the degraders secrete. And the question that we have is, 
how is this community assembled? Is that all random or um, our hypothesis is that it starts with the degraders and there's a particular trajectory how the degraders um, recruit exploiters and later down the scavengers. And um, so we have here these five degraders. We know they secrete chitinases and we know they don't secrete all the same chitinases. It's different chitinases with slightly different properties that cut somewhere different. And so then when we do, um, when we basically purify these chitinases, incubate them with chitin, and then we do an LCMS analysis on what occurs in this in vitro experiment, we can see some of this, each block here is one particular degrader. This one produces mostly monomer, but some dimer, but you can see others produce quite a lot of um, trimers and tetramers also. So very different oligomer sets are being produced. That's what metabolomics tells us. And now the question is, do these different cocktails of oligomers, do they have an influence on the next level of species, now the exploiters that grow on this? And I'm not showing you the evidence, but yes, they can. Depending on what the first degrader is, different exploiters will grow on this. So now we have exploiters, different communities of exploiters that would be associated with one of these degraders. And the question is, do these exploiters now, they secrete themselves also metabolites, but do they do this because they're a particular exploiter and they always do it? Or does it depend on what they ate? And so um, we did a similar experiment. We purify the chitinases, we do this chitin digestion, and we feed now these mixes here to the exploiters and do dynamic exometabolomics. And basically what we can see, this is uh, Jason showed a similar example. This is um, um, plotting the, the data in a, in a way that we can see what is most similar to what. And we can see that the excretion profiles look, the different colors show this is really, they, they, it de depends only on the digest and not on the species. So you will find different species in the same color here. So the color, um, the grouping in this color just depends on the abundance, uh, sorry, on the, on the availability of the, mon of the monomers and oligomers. Okay, so that means there's really a hierarchical control. The degraders, by secreting different kinases, that supports different exploiters. And these exploiters then secrete different metabolites also. And that's now the last question. What are these things that they are secreting? Because there are also these other species the scavengers um, that, that are also abundant in these, in these communities. And so now we ask, what are these secreted metabolites? And again, now we use different types of metabolomics. We can see that there's um, quite a lot of acetate in some of them. And that when, they, when the species grow on chitin, this has to do probably with the fact that there's an acetate linked to the in Glucknack. And so if this is cleaved off, you end up with one acetate, but there's also other metabolites and they're very different depending on what the primary degrader uh, um, on, and exploiter is. Glutamate, succinate, aspartate, and quite a, a range of other things. And these are quite abundant. This is not very small amounts, it's quite substantial. So for the, the purpose of all of this was to construct what we call a food web. And that's basically what you see here. So now we have, it's predicted. So this is our best guess at this point, how this community works. We have degraders that are degrading chitin. The monomers are used by exploiters and degraders alike. And there are certain molecules, this is what we now infer, that are transferred or secreted by exploiters and degraders and used by scavengers. And this is one needs a little bit more trick. The data doesn't speak to us directly. So this is a co this this network here comes only from the measured not only from the measured pairwise metabolite concentrations, but also how different combinations behave as a, as a as a small community. And so each of these experiments is we have one degrader, one exploiter with four different scavengers, and then we score how frequent are the different ones. And so now we ask how good does our data, the metabolite data, explain explain the outcome of how well certain species work together. So I think I'm exactly in time. And so um, if I'm not sure, I'm sure not everyone was interested in all the biology. I kept it hopefully not too superficial, but what I would like you to take home because this the focus was metabolomics. Um, 
I think metabolomics is metabolomics data is possibly the most difficult omics to make sense of, certainly for the normal biologist. There's no link to the genome, extremely rapid responses. So if you if you're treating your cells not super carefully, you will have within seconds first changes. ATP levels drop in less than a second. So this is a huge potential for artifacts when it is about intracellular metabolomics, and there are many indirect influences. I tried to show you two tricks, how one can delineate the indirect consequences um, from, from the ones that we are really interested in. And this is really critical for mechanistic interpretation. I ended with dynamic data and before I showed you how one can maybe use very specific smaller perturbations. And this is all part of what I started with. It's the experimental design. And it took us a long time to become a bit more clever and not um, um, go too long in, in the darkness. Um, but this is a process that the whole field is working on and it's very difficult, but it's something that also meets all the biological expertise that we have. And I would also say, if it's for intracellular metabolomics, some network-based analysis is absolutely essential. And with that, I'd like to thank Evgenia and Sammy in particular. I think I mentioned them along the way, and there were also collaborators from MIT, Otto Cordero's lab, who helped us. And I thank you for your attention.